Chapter 5 is referred to inter VLAN routing, which is a way to forward network traffic from one mainland to another one. The objective of this chapter is getting familiar to the different types of inter VLAN routing, which are legacy inter VLAN routing, router on a stick, and multilayer switch. Also, you will know how to configure routers and multilayer switches to allow inter VLAN routing. Finally, you will learn how to perform basic troubleshooting and highlight problems that are common with this process. The three main types of inter VLAN routing are inter legacy inter VLAN routing, which is similar to how routers used to connect different physical LANs using different interfaces. Now, routers usually perform inter VLAN by having two different switch ports connected to two different router interfaces, which allows inter VLAN routing. Then, router on a stick inter VLAN routing uses routers that can be configured as trunk links, and when connected to a switch port configured in trunk mode, it can create sub interfaces, which allow the router to accept VLAN tag frames. Finally, multilayer switch inter VLAN routing is the most scalable option for basic routing within the business, as it uses a layer 2 switch which can perform inter VLAN routing, rendering a dedicated router useless. The most basic process of inter VLAN routing is using legacy. In order for this to work, a router needs to have an IP address within the same VLAN range configured at each physical interface so it can communicate. The way it works is by the source determining that the destination is outside the local VLAN, so it has to send the frame to the default gateway that was previously configured, and then this default gateway will send it to the proper VLAN. The source determines the MAC address of the router interface by sending an ARP request, which, the, which will be answered by the router. When the router gets the frame, it strips the MAC portion of the frame, analyzes the IP address, and places the packet into the proper interface according to its routing table. Finally, the router needs to send an ARP request from the new physical interface to determine the MAC address of the destination device. And then when the ARP request is answered, it sends the frame to the proper destination. To configure legacy inter VLAN routing, it's necessary that the switch to which the router is connected is properly configured, which means all the VLANs are created and all the ports are assigned to the corresponding VLAN. Once the switch is configured, each router interface must be assigned an IP address as previously done, which means enter the interface manually by, the com by using the command interface, followed by the interface ID, and then issue the IP address, followed by the IP address assigned and the subnet mask. Once each interface has an IP address configured, the router can perform inter VLAN routing. You can verify this process by issuing the show IP route command from the privileged exec mode and look at the network shown. For example, in the image you can see that two VLANs were created and are directly connected to two different interfaces. The router on a stick inter VLAN routing solves the physical limitations of legacy implementations because you only have a limited number of, the, of physical interfaces on a router. The functionality remains the same, which means the process of sending and receiving frames are exactly the same as in the previous method. And one important thing is that the router needs to be connected to a switch port in trunk mode. When the router is connected to a switch port in trunk mode, it acquires the capability of tagging frames from different VLANs. And in this process, it's important to know the concept of a sub-interface. A sub-interface is a software-based virtual interface that are created within a single physical interface. To configure router on a stick, the first step you have to do is to issue the switch port mode trunk in the switch port that is directly connected to the router. It's important to remember that a router does not support dynamic trunking protocol, which means you cannot use the switch port mode dynamic auto or switch port mode dynamic desirable commands in the switch port directly connected to the router. The switch port connected to the router does not necessarily need to have a VLAN assigned. Then to create the 
sub-interfaces, you have to use the command interface, followed by the interface ID, then dot, then the sub-interface ID, which normally reflects the VLAN ID. This will take you from the global configuration mode to the sub-interface configuration. Once here, you have to use the command encapsulation, dot, one q followed by the VLAN ID. This command will indicate the router to operate within the VLAN assigned. Once the VLAN is already assigned, you can assign an IP address to the subinterface by using the command IP address followed by the IP address, then the subnet mask. After you created all of your subinterfaces, you have to exit to the global configuration mode and enter to the general interface. In this example, you will have to enter to G00 because that's where all the subnet subinterfaces were created. Then you have to issue the not shutdown command so all the subinterfaces will become active. This is done because the subinterface does not allow to be enabled manually one by one. However, if a VLAN becomes unused, you can issue the shutdown command at the proper subinterface to take down that the specific VLAN. The last step will be issue the show IP route command or ping or tracer in order to test connectivity and to test that the sub interface were properly created. Some of the most common issues between these two methods is switchboard issues, switchboard configuration issues, interface issues, which all are related to switch configuration. Had it been the proper VLAN not assigned to the proper switchboard, or the switchboard not being in trunk mode, this causes the router to not have the access to all the VLANs that were created, which results in traffic being dropped by the router because he does not know a route to go to the destination. Then we have router configuration issues which are only present in the router on a stick method. These issues occur when the wrong VLAN ID is issued using the encapsulation.1q command, which means the router becoming unable to operate because it's set to a different VLAN than the one that it's receiving traffic from. Finally, there's IP addressing issues that happen when the wrong subnet mask is used or the IP address assigned to a certain subinterface or interface is not within the range of the VLAN created. Then we have multilayer switching. Most enterprise networks use these multilayer switches to achieve high packet processing rates using hardware-based switching. The Catalyst multilayer switches support the following types of layer 3 interface. The routed port, which is pure layer 3 interface, and the switch virtual interface, also named SBI, which are virtual LAN interfaces for inter-VLAN routing. The network designer extended the switch portion of the network as much as possible because switch operated at hot web speeds, which were more faster in the past than the routers, which used software speeds. This means access distribution and core layers were configured to communicate at layer 2, but this created loop issues. That's why the spanning free technologies were used to solve these issues. The spanning tree protocol allows network design to include redundant links to provide automatic backup paths if an active link fails, without the danger of bridge loops or the need for manually enabling or disabling these backup links. However, routing now has become faster, and routing can be transferred to the core and distribution layers without impacting network performance. Distribution switches are configured as layer tree gateways for the user of each access switch VLAN. Then, the layer 3 ports are normally implemented between the distribution and core layer. As it was mentioned before, an SBI is a virtual interface that is connected within a multi-layer switch. There is no physical port dedicated to the interface, and it performs the same function for the VLAN as router interface and is configured in the same way. By default, an SBI is created for the default VLAN, which is the VLAN 1. This SBI permits remote switch administration. Any additional SBI must be explicitly created. SBIs are created the first time the VLAN interface configuration mode is entered for a particular VLAN SBI, which means using the command interface followed by the VLAN ID. ISBI can be created for any VLAN that exists on the switch. The VLAN number used corresponds to the VLAN tag associated with the data frames on an 800 
2.1Q encapsulated trunk or the VLAN ID configured for an access point. The reason to configure SBIs is because an SBI provides a gateway for a VLAN so the traffic can be routed into or out of it. Also, it provides layer 3 IP connectivity to the switch. Finally, it supports routing protocols and bridging configurations. The advantages of using SBIs is that they are much faster than router and a stick as they use multiple interfaces to connect the different VLANs. No need for external links from the switch to the router for routing. There is also not limited to one link and latency is much lower because it does not need to leave the switch in order to achieve its destination. Other type of layer 3 port are routed ports. A routed port is a physical port that acts similarly to an interface on a router. It is not associated with a particular VLAN. Layer 2 protocols such as SDP do not function in a router port, but some protocols function at layer 3. Routed ports are also used for point-to-point -point links, such as connecting to a one router. Also are configured between switches in the core and distribution layer. To configure a routed port, you have to use the non switch port command on the appropriate ports. Then you assign an IP address and layer 3 parameters as necessary. Finally, you verify the IP routing is globally enabled and that applicable routing protocols are configured. The advantages of using a multi-layer switch is that a multi-layer switch can have both the SBI and the routed ports in a single switch. It also has faster routing because multi-layer switches forward either layer 2 or layer 2 traffic in hardware. The only drawback to this method is that a multi-layer switch costs much more than a simple switch. Finally, it's important to know how to configure a static route on a multi-layer switch. The Cisco Switch Database Management SDM provides multiple templates for the Catalyst 2960 switch. This can be enabled to support specific roles depending on how the switch is used in the network. The first step to configure a static route on a multi-layer switch is to issue the command SDM prefer land based routing and the global configuration mode. Then you need to reload the switch. When the switch finished reloading, you use the IP route command. This command allows the switch to perform IP routing. Then you configure the default route. You can configure the default route by using the command IP route followed by four zeros separated by dots, then another four zeros separated by dots, and then you finish by adding the Netscope address. Then to verify, you have to use the show IP route command. This command will display the routing table of the switch and you have to verify that the static address that you created was properly added. The last topic in this chapter is troubleshoot layer 3 switching. Layer 2 switching has the same issues as legacy interbulan routing and router of a stick interbulan routing. The next item should be checked for accuracy. The VLANs, they must be defined across all the switches, must be enabled on trunks ports, and ports must be in the right VLANs. The SBIs, the SBI must have the correct IP address or subnet mask, they must be up, and they must match with the VLAN number. The routing ports must be enabled. Also, each interface on network must be added to the routing protocol. Finally, the host. The host must have the correct IP address or subnet mask and must have a default gateway associated with an SBI or routed port. Well, that's everything in Chapter 5. Remember that if you have some doubts or something was not clear enough in the video, you can always check the curriculum. In this chapter, you will find some examples and some activities that will help you to understand how something's configured or how something works. So that's basically it. Thank you.